she's finished. You may be seated. All right. Welcome this afternoon to the marriage of Chris and Carla. Thank you so much for being here to be witnesses of the vows they make before God and before you uh, this day. And uh, we appreciate you being here very, very much. Let's bow for prayer together, shall we? Father, we thank you for this opportunity for us to be together this afternoon. Lord, thank you for Chris and for Carla and for most of all, Lord, I thank you for their faith in Christ as their Savior. And I thank you for how you have worked in their lives to bring them together and to bring them to this point and this day when they'll pledge their mutual love for each other and they'll state their vows to love each other till death do they part. Lord, I pray your hand will be upon this ceremony today and that you'll bless this marriage and your hand will be upon their lives as they become one. In Jesus' name, amen. It is an honor to officiate the marriage today between you two. Uh, more than anything else, the world needs some godly homes. Our country needs godly homes. Especially it needs some godly marriages and some biblical marriages that I know both of you desire. And in fact, it's still important to God, as we discussed in our counseling session a little bit, that marriage is honorable in all. And God is the one who instituted the institution of marriage. He began it back in the garden between Adam and Eve, and so it's very close to the heart of God. Yet somehow, marriage has become a battlefield that God never intended for it to become. Did you know that out of ten couples who marry, four will end in divorce, two will be intolerable, two will be okay, and only two will find a kind of joy that God intended a couple to have in marriage. Is the biblical concept of marriage still workable today? Does it still work in 2024? Sadly, many don't answer that question because they don't know what the biblical concept of marriage really is all about. They don't know what the Bible purpose of marriage was for. In fact, one Sunday school teacher asked the class if anybody knew what the Bible had to say about marriage. And little Billy raised his hand and he said, I do, I do. The Bible says, forgive them for they know not what they do. <laughs> now, that's funny, but that's somehow the concept sometimes of what the world thinks of marriage. And there's all kind of jokes that kind of go along with that. Uh, but we have to understand what God intended uh, for marriage. And one of the things that would be the role that the man has in marriage and the role that the woman plays in marriage. And in the last 20 years, we've been exposed to a lot of things that have to do with superheroes. Uh, I uh, read recently in the last 20 years, there have been four Superman movies and three Batman movies and three Terminator movies. And sometimes people come into marriage and they think they're meeting Mr. Terrific. Uh, superhero, you know, who's going to uh, solve all the problems and be the leader in the home. And after all, he has a direct connection to God and he's going to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And he's going to uh, be stable and he's going to have the ability to, to lead us as a family and to uh, help us out on our decisions. And whatever his decision is, that's what we'll do. And everybody looks to him as Mr. Terrific, but he's not Mr. Terrific. I'll say more about that in just a little bit. And sometimes the fellow thinks he's getting Mrs. Terrific, okay? I mean, she's the epitome of Proverbs 31. 
uh, she rises early and takes care of her household and uh, she, she has your complete trust and confidence and always looking out for your best interests and uh, providing for a household and uh, taking care of needs of the home and you know Mr. and Mrs. Terrific are just about as real as Superman and the Terminator and any other the superheroes are. They just don't exist. All right? So we discussed in our time together the purpose of marriage, and that is ministry. Ministering to each other in your marriage. And in a recent survey I read, According to re modern marriage in America is limited in its ability to speak five simple statements. And it's not that a husband and wife can't say the words. It's just they have a hard time coming out. Even when they know they're for the good of the marriage. And just as kryptonite would take down Superman, <laughs> the inability to utter these statements and mean it can be the kryptonite to your marriage. And here they are, five statements. Number one, I don't know. Number two, I was wrong. Number three, I need help. Number four, I'm afraid. And number five, I'm sorry. It's amazing the tragedy that comes sometimes in relationships because those five statements will not be uttered or will not be admitted by either the man or the woman. And of course, we know the Bible talks about the role of the husband and the role of the wife. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the role of the man. And it talks about, first of all, in verse 21, Paul says that everybody, all of us, as Christians, are to submit one to another. Sometimes we like to start with the next verse that says, wives, submit to your own husbands. But the truth is, it starts at verse 21 when we're submitting one to another. We voluntarily put our, put our needs behind the needs of somebody else. You put your needs behind the needs of your wife. You put your needs behind the needs of your husband. That's submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Then it says, wives, you submit yourselves to your own husbands. And he is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. And so just as the church submits to Christ in everything, you submit to your husband and his leadership. And it's, it's not based on him. We've discussed that. It's based on your relationship with the Lord. And that's the submission that, that you have. You're, the goal is that you two become one, okay? One in the Lord. And that doesn't happen if you don't do what God, if you don't embrace the roles that God gave you to embrace. You submitting and you loving her as Christ loved the church. You see, we're called, when the Bible says, Chris, that the Lord loved the church and gave himself for it, so husbands ought to love their wives and give themselves for her. He never said that he's the head of the church to tell us what to do. A lot of times that's the main thinking that people think. But it's a great responsibility to give of ourselves for their sake. It's really a sacrificial love that the Lord talks about here that Jesus was willing to do for us. When you take your vow to Carla this morning and or this afternoon in front of the witnesses, you're taking it before God. And you're promising that your allegiance will be to her and no one else, so long as you both shall live. You know, we we talked in the counseling about Adam and Eve in that first marriage. You remember? And how they they knew that they loved each other. And you remember why we said that was? Because who else was there, right? <laughs> that, that was his them, okay? And, and in a way, that's the way it should be in marriage. There should be no one else. If she should feel like there's no one else. And that's how Christ loves us. And so he was willing to even lay down his life because he loved us so much. And he loved us. He gave himself for us. Now, when, man, when I tell a man that and he say, but if I, if I lay down my life, if I sacrifice for her, she's going to walk all over me. You know, I'll just be the, 
Mr. Milk Toast, you know, and she'll do it. She'll, she'll run me over and be the boss and all that. But God says, baloney. That's a big Greek word, but it's baloney. A man who is willing to die every day for his wife will find joy in his marriage. That's what God says. And the one who doesn't will never know marriage as God intended for it to be. So it's an honor to be the head, but it means responsibility and it means initiative. And so he didn't just make us the head so we could tell everybody what to do. He made it the head so we could love our wives and love our families. And we would look out for their interests above our own interests. It means service, not authority. And so he warned us about that. Jesus did. In fact, he was the example. He said, I, his disciples arguing that one day about who's going to be the greatest, you know. And Jesus said, no, I'm among you as one that serves. You become like a little child and you serve others. And so God's plan for marriage in 2024 is just as vibrant and just as right as it ever was. Even back to the beginning in the garden. Two people totally committed to pleasing the other person. Rather than simply asking what's in it for me. All right. So few things, I think we mentioned this in our counseling, few things will bring out our selfish nature as being involved in marriage. It's really a reflection. And we look in the mirror and we see who we really are. And so the cure is Jesus Christ. And you have him as your foundation in your marriage. And you've made him first uh, already just in your time of dating and getting to know one another. And he'll continue to make the difference in your home. The whole marriage is to reflect the relationship Christ has with us as believers. And now you get to show that and showcase that as an example in your home. And that's what God intended. And so with your vows today in front of God and these witnesses, you start that process of showing the world what a relationship is with Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I pray now this afternoon as they prepare to exchange their vows one with another, not only in front of these witnesses, but before you, that, Lord, we'll all listen carefully and will always be able to be an encouragement to both Chris and Carla about the vows that we saw and we heard that day. And I pray, Lord, that you continue, as they have so far in their relationship, you continue to have them honor the Lord Jesus in all they do. Thank you for their testimony. Thank you for their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I pray you'd bless this time this afternoon. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, if you, Chris and Carla, have freely and deliberately chosen each other as partners for life, I want you to join your hands. Chris, will you have this woman to be your wedded wife? Will you love her, honor, and keep her in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, and forsaking all others, keep the only under her so long as you both shall live? Do you so promise? Yes. Carla, will you have this man to be your wedded husband? Will you love him, honor and keep him in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, and forsaking all others, keep the only unto him so long as you both shall live? Do you so promise? Yes. Chris, if you'd repeat after me the following words. I, Chris, I, Chris. Take, thee, take thee, Carla, to be my wedded wife, to, wife. to have and to hold, from this day forward, this day forward. For, better, for, worse, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer. In, sickness in, health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish. Till, death do us part. till death do us part. And Carla, repeat after me the following words. I, Carla, I, Carla. Take, thee, Chris, take thee, Chris, to be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, 
for richer or poorer, for richer or poorer in, sickness in, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and obey, to love, cherish, and obey till death do us part. No way has ever been found to show one's love for another better than the exchanging of rings. A ring never ends, and your love for one another should never end. It's a constant reminder of not only of your love for each other, but of God's unending love for us. And Chris, you have a ring for Carla? You can put that on the third finger of her left hand. And that, if you'd say this, this ring is a reminder of my constant faith and abiding love. And Carla, you also have a ring for Chris, I believe. There you go. And you put that on the third finger of his left hand. And again, this ring is a constant reminder of my constant faith and abiding love. Let's pray together. Father, as you have heard the vows now that have been made before you and these witnesses, Lord, they have vowed to be with one another, to love, to cherish each other through the ups and downs, through the betters or through the worses, through the health and through the sickness. I pray, God, that they would always honor these vows in their life and keep you first in their marriage. And we'll thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For as much then as you, Chris, and you, Carla, having offered yourselves to one another, believing it is God's will that you become husband and wife, as your pastor and as an officer of the laws of the state of Ohio, and as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in the presence of your family and your friends here this afternoon, and, of course, our Heavenly Father. I take great pleasure in pronouncing you husband and wife. You can kiss your bride. And what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It's great joy and pleasure to introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. Chris Sorrell. They're going to be at the back so you can see them as you go out. These young men are going to dismiss you row by row so you can uh, go out and greet them on the way out. The reception down at uh, uh, Deer Park, Deer Creek State Park, there's a map on the table right at the bottom of the steps. And if you need directions for that, exactly where it is, please feel free to pick up a map and uh, that'll help you get to the reception if you're going down there, all right? And so these young men will dismiss row by row. Fellas, thank you.